a scion of many worlds. Stop staring at me, Madame Geyer states after a while. You wanted my attention, now you have it. Jasper returns. He's emptied himself of emotion and chosen to approach this as a battle of another kind. She wants him to make a mistake. Her every action is designed to make him lose control. If he does, she wins. She will not win. I have several questions. First, assuming that I can get you to agree to sell me your food, how much is available for purchase that will not cause a famine in the gold lands? He asks, and she seems taken aback. Well, I, uh, Lady Midwife, if you would be so kind as to fetch someone who does know this information, I would be appreciative, Jasper says before turning back to Madame Geyer. Who knows this information? Well, a Miss Well, it seems, Jasper remarks, and to her credit, the midwife doesn't smirk at the awful joke. No, there's no one. I don't think there's anyone named Miss Well. You need... Madame Geyer cuts off the joke and starts snapping her fingers as she tries to remember. Isabella Slipway. She's a boring twerp that's damn near a midwife. She's such a pushover. After the rather insulted midwife leaves, Geyer leans back and tries to stare down the utterly impassive and completely unimpressed Jasper. Thankfully, that little slip told him something. Does the local culture really value intimidation and force that much? Perhaps it does. If they're on a high enough level for medieval society, they should have some grasp of law, but what if their axiom abilities accelerated it, or at least allowed them to subsist at an Iron Age level rather than a Stone Age level as their planning abilities would suggest? You do realize that I will personally burn and scatter the ashes of anything you would dare to even think of stealing. I understand, Jasper says, and she glares at him for a time. The silence grows heavy between them as she tries to intimidate someone that's honestly contemplating personally fighting the entire country. Needless to say, she's not having much success. If she were human, she would be sweating by the time the midwife returns with a frazzled-looking fire aromenta holding a tome. While Miss Slipway consults her notes, could you do me the kindness of answering a technical question as to the nature of the grand midwife business? Jasper asks the Nagasha who can do an amazing deer-in-the-headlights impersonation for someone who would only understand two words in four of that expression. Depending. I'm not going to ask for the hows, but related to the end results, Jasper says, and she nods. In what ways do children born of your methodology differ from their parents? Any child I help create is a hybrid between myself and the mother, taking what are hopefully more strength than weaknesses from us both to form a new being entirely, although there is a large element of randomness. You don't control what your child is? You are a savage. Madame Geyer says, and is thoroughly ignored as the midwife stares at Jasper for a few moments before shaking herself out of her stupor. Right. Well, the difference is that it exaggerates the traits of the parents at random. Beyond that, every child is her mother come again, but aspects of the body and personality are changed. Say each trait has a number from one to three. The mother is considered a two in all traits regardless of how she was compared to her mother. The daughter then has random numbers assigned, either being suppressed or enhanced. So there are some differences, but far less pronounced in the hybrids I create. Oh my yes, much less pronounced than a, a mating birth, the midwife says, and Jasper nods meaning that in all likelihood certain traits have been exaggerated to the point of parody by sheer dumb luck. Jasper notes and receives a nod. Do you know which ones, and by how much? There's a census that I help take, but I'm not privy to the wholeness of it. You would need to speak to the heads of the order to get a proper look at it. Although it is unlikely, the information is very personal, and she's cut off as Jasper holds up his claw. I understand private records, but would general inquiries be allowed? 
such as asking what traits in general have been exaggerated, it would be an enormous boon to the efforts of the undaunted. Yes, that shouldn't be a problem. I can't guarantee it. I'm just the local midwife, but it should be doable. She answers and he nods. Thank you very much. I have many jobs these days. Warlord, ambassador, scout, and archaeologist all at once, among many others. Would my work at the dam count me as an amateur architect or just a laborer? Did you have someone else telling you what to do? The Nagasha asks, with a bit of a smile. He nods. Then you're a laborer as well. Good. I need some practical work to keep me grounded. Says the Urthani, she asks incredulously. You may have noticed that I'm rather odd as Urthani go. With an incredible gift for understatement, she answers and Jasper starts thinking quickly. Ah, a bit more is clicking into place. Those that are more academically inclined, they almost all join the grand midwives or the star seekers, don't they? Hey, if you're done stating the screamingly obvious, I have the numbers here, Madam Geyer snaps. We have 5,000 zins of food and various grains and fruit. In total or for sale? Jasper asks, wondering what the hell a zin is. For sale, she says, and he nods. All right. After we agree upon a price, I will have a look at the supply so that there's no confusion between what you define a zin as and what I define a zin as. Do you think I would try to cheat you? She asks, and he gives her a flat look. She flutters her eyelids. Again, this is due to consequences. You tried to poison me. I think you duplicitous, so I'm going to make sure I get what I pay for. Jasper says slowly, and she scowls at him. Back to business. How much metal does the gold lands require annually in order to produce as much food as it can? He's using simpler language than he would like, but you speak Spanish in Spain, French in France, and simple on La Cron. Otherwise, no one understands you. About one hund. Miss Slipway begins before Madame Geyer snatches the book from her. The much more timid woman backs away with a squeak of distress. Jesus Christ, this planet needs fucking hall monitors. Two hundred zins of iron, Madame Geyer begins to the visible shock of Miss Slipway. Forty-five of copper, fifteen of nickel, and some change. There's the very clear urge to simply grab the book out of the little idiot's hands and read it over himself, an urge that grows larger as she carelessly throws the handwritten, leather-bound record book at Miss Slipway's head. Thankfully, the woman ducks and Jasper, being himself, is fast enough to catch it with an aura of gentleness around his claws and he hands the book back to the record keeper, one of the only intelligent people he's encountered in the gold lands. Good. Now, Miss Slipway, how much excess food can the Goldlands produce with that entire allotment of metal and her river unblocked? There are a fair number of mines in Miru, and due to the local earth Irumenta being fairly good at what they do, there's a huge amount of metal. The only reason they're not in competition with the city-states is due to them being so far away from each other. Hey, you're dealing with me. Madam Geyer protests. Yes, but you're lying and doing a very bad job of it. Jasper chides her and turns back to Miss Slipway. She's not very good at her job, is she? The deer in the headlights impression is uncanny. Well, we don't have a lot of good relations with other parties. We need someone who can insult other people back because nothing's happening anyways. Hmm, Jasper muses as he glances from Geyer to Slipway. Anyways, how much excess food is grown in the gold lands with that much metal and one of the rivers unblocked? Uh, 15,000 zins in spring, 25 in summer, 20 in fall, and only 5 in winter. Miss Slipway explains and Jasper nods. He crunches the math and nearly face palms when his mind comes up with a repeating number. God damn, does he hate division. So roughly 65,000 zins of food out and you need 300 to maintain it, he says, and he considers a little more thoroughly. He wants to use practical math, 
but the only way to get these people on board is to make them think they're cheating him. Fucking great. He hates this. He hates the idea of being cheated, and for a moment he entertains the thought of just taking over. These idiots need a strong hand. But he's one man and will need to really go through the Star Seekers if he's going to find someone he can trust to delegate a nation to. A tall order. There's no haggling. Nothing less than 300 zins of metal is needed for our harvest. Deal, he says, and she suddenly freezes. What? I said deal. But we will exchange the metals at the turning of the seasons in exchange for the food in the future. But this time you get the year's payment now to break the famine and we will get those 5,000 zins. But I'm aware you're trying to cheat me. But you're worse at that than you are at lying. He says in his mind, he wants to lecture the twerp, but she's the type to renege on a deal to spite someone. A vicious little bitch. And he needs that food. He's going to hunt to supplement it because he suspects they'll try to slip sawdust or something equally insane in. There's no way you just have that kind of metal. Just lying around. No way. She protests and he grins at her. I've personally done away with the heads of the Lux way. I then found their personal logs and looted every scrap of wealth they've hidden away. If I were to claim it as mine, then I would be the richest living soul on the continent. I can't speak for the empires across the sea, but you would have to look long and hard to find anyone with more wealth than I. Why would you spend it all? Why give it up for the sakes of others? Wealth is worthless alone. I can't eat gold. It's terrible company. Too soft to hold an edge for long or retain its shape without deforming as a weapon or armor. Besides, the idiots wanted the gold lands desperate and ready for conquest. Since those fools are my vanquished enemies, it's in my interest to undo their work. So take your excess of metal, enjoy it. But remember that biting the hand that feeds you rarely ends well. But you're the one buying food, wait. What? Madam Geyer asks. Do we have an agreement? Yes. Good. Can I hammer out the tedious details with Miss Slipway? He asks. Yes. Excellent. Good day, madam, Jasper says, rising up and quickly gesturing for Miss Slipway to follow. There's a nearby room away from Madame Geyer and the guards where both of them sit down and Miss Slipway opens up the book in front of him. She's really trying to cheat you. Our needs total less than 183 zins of metal. I know, but no one wants to break a deal when they're the ones that have a huge win. What Madame Geyer doesn't know is that we produce an obscene amount of metals between the mountain mines, the fairest swamps and numerous hills bloated with minerals. It's why Miru has such a hard time growing food, too much metal in the ground. So we're exchanging what we both have in surplus for what we need. It's called a mutually beneficial agreement. With the bargain, we're about to sort out the details of both the gold lands and Miru Prosper. Everyone wins. Why didn't you just bring that up to Madame Geyer? You were in the room with me. Was she acting like someone who wanted me to get anything I wanted without a massive struggle? No. So let's hash out exactly what kind of metals you need and in what quantity. She only mentioned iron, copper, and tin by name. There are a fair few more, aren't they? Lead for weights, zinc for coatings and some medicines, silver for some very delicate tools, we even need cobalt to scare scavengers away from some of our fields. She says, and he nods. She looks up at him and frowns a little as she's clearly considering things. You really made it your goal to not talk to Madame Geyer, didn't you? She literally poisoned all my goodwill towards her. The moment I saw a chance to work around her, I started pushing for it. He admits, and she nods in appreciation of the wise move. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. You know, it's kind of weird for someone to not be... Well, there are some things very wrong with Lacrin and its people. You seem to have sidestepped much of it, and that's a blessing. But it's meant your life has been full of trials that are seemingly unrelenting. Yes. If it helps, think of yourself like a gemstone, 
slowly formed from base elements by enormous pressure and heat into something truly wondrous. He offers and she blinks up at him in shock, then smiles. Thank you. That does help, she says before leaning into the book at an odd angle. He had noticed earlier that she had her nose literally in the books, but he assumed it was a nervous habit. She's fairly calm now. Why is she still doing it? Is there something wrong? Oh, um, well, if you're not comfortable sharing, that's fine. It's not that, it's... How do I explain this? I don't understand how people can interpret things that aren't this close so easily. Everyone's always guessing right, and I never can, she says, holding a hand right in front of her face. She then squints and adjusts the distance to turn and point at him, then suddenly has a look of shock as she seemingly sees him for the first time and is stunned by what she saw. Oh, I think you may be nearsighted. Hmm. I'll have to ask my people, but I think I may be able to help you with that. Really? Yes, you're nearsighted. Perhaps even myopic. Both of these are well understood by my people, so let me sweeten the pot a bit. You help me sort all this out and I'll start bothering my brother and higher-ups to help you see better. What about my family? My sisters and mother are much the same. Them as well. Just help me end this famine. Help me help the Goldlands and Miru both, and then I shall help you personally. I swear it. He promises her, and she squints at him to get a good look at his face and try to find some hint of deception. Her face slackens after a short while, and she just stares at him for a bit. Why? Why what? Why are you doing this? I'm undaunted. I'm here to help, and nothing can stop me.